if you take care of your health and nutrition, this is what you can achieve with the rest of your life. Um, and so, you know, it, the, my first book was basically like, here's what you've got to do. Here's mm -hmm. the reason why. But this is more of the like, what's the potential of mm -hmm. living your life with, without sugar coating? Yep. Um, what's the potential of, and, and breaking it down to, so the, the basic analogy is if you, you know, if you eat, you know, candy pecans or candy apples or what, okay, well, you're eating it that because it's got the sugar coating and it tastes great and it's mm -hmm. going to give you a little bit of a sugar high. But what happens if you just eat the pecans or you just eat the apples or just eat the food without the sugar coating, you may not get that immediate high, but you're going to get a lifelong high out of having a healthy body and what can you accomplish? Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's sort of the premise. And then what can you accomplish if, if, if you take the sugar coating off of your life, and let people see your passion and what you really want to achieve mm. and bring the people around you that can help you achieve that. Welcome back to another episode of the Live Life Longer Show. Today's guest is an author, entrepreneur, podcast host, coach, and athlete. After growing up in Baton Rouge, he moved to moved back to his birth state to attend Texas A&M University on a track and field scholarship, earning a degree in exercise physiology coupled with competing at a high level as a distance runner has given him the knowledge and tools to transform his client's health and wellness. Jerry and his wife, Jenny, married in June of 2000 and have lived in Hewitt, Texas since 2002. They have two children, Abigail and Ty. As a certified life breakthrough coach, Jerry believes in a functional approach to solving problems. Discovering and eliminating the true source of pain, what is holding you back, is far more important than treating the symptoms. Jerry launched the Confidence Through Health podcast in 2019, appropriately named after his first book, Confidence Through Health. The weekly episodes strive to provide insight into all areas of a healthy lifestyle. To find out more, go to allinhealthandwellness.com and you can subscribe to the podcast at confidencethroughhealth.com or search for it on Apple Podcast. Jerry, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Dan. Yeah, I'm super excited uh, to learn more about you and your business and the work that you're doing. Uh, we actually met through uh, Lewis Howes and, and his inner circle. He's got uh, a group of people that... Uh, can join and learn more about marketing and business, and uh, we we connected through that. So I'm really happy right. uh, we met. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I read off your bio, but why don't you share uh, share a little bit more? I know there's more in there that I haven't shared. You're big into coaching yeah. and track and field, and you're involved in your local church. Um, so why don't you just share a little bit more about about yourself? Well, yeah, I mean it's it's funny because a, a, bio, a true bio for me takes like it's, it's almost like four or five pages. It's right. ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and, and I didn't grow up thinking that's what I wanted to do is like have this huge long list of things that I do. Sure. Um, it's just sort of organically grown and one thing's led to another. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, so I, I got hooked into volunteer coaching for uh, a local school for cross country and track. Um, we're right in the middle of cross country season. Thankfully we're mm. having one, um, with all the restrictions and everything going on, but yeah, uh, given my history of, of running myself, I mean, it's, it's great, you know, to, to stay connected in that way. Um, it's also great because it gives me a chance to try my own theories about like, I think this would work on me, mm -hmm. but you know, it's not working like I would think it should. So I've got five or seven or eight kids that I can like, let's try this workout on y'all and see if, <laughs> if it's, if it's, if it's, is, it, is it me that's the problem or is it the workouts is flawed sure. type of thing? Um, and, and test the results and stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, a little extra benefit, you know, on my side of it. Uh, but very involved in our church. I, I became very involved in a community a couple of years ago. Um, really, and it was, it's interesting because it's through partially Lewis Howes and listening to his podcast and mm -hmm. other people that are, are successful. And you say, okay, well, how do, how do I reach that level? Um, and whether it's in you know, health and fitness and business. Yep. And, and for me, it was business. I had just lost my business and I was like, well, everybody, I, everybody that I kept coming across was like, if you're success, if you want to be successful, you have to do what they do. 
And that is, you know, take care of your health, take care of your fitness. I'm like, okay, I've already got those two things down. And they're like, and everybody who's successful at that high level reads a book a week. Mm. And I was like, yeah, I'm not even close to that. <laughs> um, and I mean, like I read five books in, in 20 years from college, like, yep. you know, and so it was like, you know, that's just not it. it okay. Where do I start? Right. It was my first question. All right. So where do I start? Cause I started a business. I don't have any money cause I'm obviously starting from ground zero. Mm -hmm. So I can't go buy all these books. It'd be great if I could and have this huge library behind me. But, uh, I was actually running one day and was thinking I was running around town. Everybody had started noticing me and pointing out and saying, Hey, you're that guy that runs all over the place. Yep. That's me. <laughs> Cause on a typical day I'll run, I'll run eight to 10 miles. Um, wow. That's a lot of mileage. And our town is, is, uh, we're about 13,000 people. So it's mm -hmm. a pretty small town. Yeah. Um, get noticed pretty easily. So you covered the whole town during your runs probably <laughs> multiple times. Yeah. Um, and so it hit me, I was like, okay, well, you know, the library has a lot of books, so maybe I should just check out the library and start doing that and start reading books there. And so I got home and I researched it and the library had, I'm, I'm not joking. They had like 10 of the business books that were on this list that I had already started compiling Yep. of like 150 books. They had 10 of like the hot, these are what you need. Yep. And I was like, okay, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, that, that's going to give me 10 weeks if I do a book a week. Um, so when, when, you know, next day I'm out running and thinking about it, and like, how can I this happen? And it just hit me that if everybody sees me through town, why don't I market this fundraiser and raise money for the library? They buy the books, then everybody in town can use the books. Very cool. Because nobody's going to, you know, if I go out and say, hey, if you see me running, can you donate some money to me so I can buy some books for myself? Like, right. That's not going to, that's not going to work. Right. Um, but we raised enough money, for, or I raised enough money, I guess, through the community the first year to uh, expand the, li the library by 50 business books. Nice. Um, and that was three years ago, and we've done it every year since. Very um, cool. So, yeah, it, and it turned out to be, it it's uh, turned out to be like, two, it took me 21 days mm -hmm. to run. I ran every street in town. Wow. Like every foot of every street in town. <laughs> that is so, so cool. So it took a while. But, yeah, it's a but great it goal. Cool. It's a really cool goal and, and something that you were obviously passionate about. But right. I'd like that you made it not just about yourself, but something that other people can benefit from as well. Really cool. Well, and, and there were people that there were a couple of people that actually came out and ran with me or jogged with me or nice, like, you know, and so and that was another point of it was like, let's get the community active yep. Yep. Um, through this. And so uh, at the beginning of this year, beginning of 2020, before all the lockdown and everything, we actually had a 5k as part of the fundraiser this year. So okay. Um, hopefully once things relax and we can start doing things like that again, we'll have another yeah. an annual thing. Very cool. Um, so I love that. That's great. So I want to kind of get into some of your work here. Uh, you have your book out, you have your own podcast, you have a new book coming right. out in January. Um, and then you yep. also have your, your coaching business. And I understand you have a, a, a juice bar as well. Is that right? Yeah. My wife and I bought a juice bar this year. Yeah. Um, tough year to buy a juice bar, but right. You know, right. In, the, in the restaurant area, but yeah, but that's another, it, it's expanding on that health side of things. Of right. just, um, there's not a lot of, uh, so I live in the Waco area, so there's not a lot of options from a health standpoint here. We're not yet, uh, when you think of Texas and the healthy places, you think of Austin yep. that are, you know, um, Denton is, is got a big healthy community part to it. Okay. But, um, Waco's a little bit behind the times sure. um, in that aspect. And so it's not a lot of places to go where you can get, you know, 75% or 90% of the menu to be mm. truly healthy food. Yep. It's interesting. I, I guess in a way it's, it's probably brings a challenge to yourself to be in an area where they don't focus on health. But mm -hmm. in many ways, it can be a really great thing that you can kind of be like the health guy in your area for everybody to go to that might be interested right. in it. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's funny because, um, I mean, I've gotten a lot of media from, from various yep. things, you know, and, and obviously the fundraising helped in that part of it. But, uh, it's interesting because my kids now are like, Oh, you're, you're famous. I'm like, no, I'm not. That's, that's, <laughs> but you know, they're like, but you're famous here because we'll go somewhere and, you know, they'll be like, oh, 
you know, I can't go anywhere without knowing somebody now. Um, and, and so they're always, you know, like, Hey, you're the health guy or you're the running guy, you know, those two things connected. So, yeah. So, so let's get into a little bit of your current work. You know, obviously you have your book out right. and your podcast. Um, and then let's also touch on, on your business as well, but let's start with yeah. your book and your podcast. Uh, yeah. you know, some of the topics that you like to cover, you know, obviously the, the titles confidence through health. Um, yeah. so what would you like, you know, my audience to know a little bit more about that content? Well, the book came about, um, interestingly enough, because I kept having the same conversation with people, mm-hmm. um, and with potential clients or new clients and, and not that that's bad. I mean, I think a lot of times it's typical. You're, you, you're in an area, you're trying to talk about what you know and, but it was, some of the, the, the myths, of course, were around health and sure. you get into, you know, some of the misinformation that's out there, the different mm-hmm. fad diets and things like that and trying to break those down. And so um, it just sort of hit me one day. I was like, you know what? And it, this was right about the time when I was trying to read a bunch of books. And it, it, I think there was a point in my life, 5, 10, 15 years ago, where it was like, man, I would never write a book because it seems like it, you've got to just have this <laughs> immense amount of knowledge right. about something. Right. And then I'm reading these books and I'm like, this, this doesn't seem like it would be that hard to write something yeah. about um, if I knew it. Yep. And kept having the same conversation. And I was like, you know what, if I just wrote all this down, mm-hmm. then maybe I could just hand them like, at first it was you know going to be like a 15 or 20 page ebook just to, sure you know, Hey, you want to be a client? Here's a quick little intro into how, how I think and yep. how the real health works in your body. And then, uh, as I was writing, it just became more and more and more. Um, mm. and so it's really, it, it, it breaks down the myths of different, um, diets that are out there, the misinformation mm-hmm. out there and really looks at it as explaining it. Your cell in your body wants specific things in order to operate function yep. properly. Yep. Um, and if we give those cells the right things, then there's no other option but for them to be healthy. Mm. Um, now, it that doesn't mean it's going to change in five hours or 24 hours or, you know, sure. it's going to take time depending on, like as they say, you know, the longer you've taken to get in the bad point that you are from a health standpoint, the longer it's going to take for you to get healthy. Right. Um there are some parts that will turn around quickly mm-hmm. and others that won't. Um, and I, I sort of talk about that and explain that, but it's, it is, it's a, it's a breaking down. Here's, here's the health of your body. Here's nutrition side of it. Here's the fitness side of it. Mm. Um, and, and really looking at, okay, well, you've got the different diets out there and this diet says to do it this way. That may work for some people. Um, and it may not work for others. And right. why does it, why does it not work? Yep. You know, um, so that if you try that, and it doesn't work. It's not that that diet stinks. Mm. I mean, it may, but it may not. It may just not work for you. Right. Exactly. So I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways. Something I'm learning as I talk to more people about nutrition um, mm-hmm. is that it's there's no one diet for everybody. You know, there's right. of course, we have hundreds of different fad diets out there. And each one of them is going to try to market it as like, we are the only diet for everyone. Sure. That's obviously not the case. When we all have different needs, we all have different body types, um, and different, different DNA. So it's important for you to, I think, experiment and try different foods, try different types of nutrition to see what fits, fits you best. So, well, and I think you're going for, and, and what's combined in there is what you do along the way. Mm. You know, you start, you're starting at a different point than, than everybody yes. else. But then also, what do you do along the way to get to where you are today? Yep. Um, you know, and I can use an example that, you know, like, cause it's one of the things my wife did when she was a teenager, um, was she took Accutane, um, you know, because if acne was really bad and, yep. you know, the doctor said you needed to, well, it, and essentially what we're still dealing with effects of that, you know, 30 years later, hmm in how her body is not responding to nutrition the right way because it basically it took care of the acne of right. course 
but it blew up her microbiome and yeah. caused all kinds of issues. And so it's, it's lifelong stuff that, you know, well, you've got, you've got certain things that you start with and then at different stages, you do different things to damage that. Yeah. Track. It's so, so interesting to think about the stuff that we either intake, whether it's food or medicine or, uh, different products and how much it affects our microbiome. Mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. um, Dr. Stephen Gundry on my podcast a few months back. Yeah, he's big into nutrition and talks about having a healthy microbiome and mm -hmm. and uh, kind of sealing that lining of our gut, which most uh, he he thinks most people have a leaky gut. So oh, yeah. you got to fix your nutrition in order yep. to to kind of fix that leaky gut. And he talked about how ibuprofen is basically just like throwing a hand grenade into your, mm -hmm. your system and it just like blows up your whole yep. microbiome. And I was just like, whoa, I didn't even know that. So I'm just <laughs> learning learning more and more about what yeah. kind of affects that. And it's it's pretty crazy stuff. Well, and one of the things that, that, that I mentioned in my book and one of the things that like it came about that, and I just had this conversation with a friend the other day who was asking me, we were at a cross country meet, his, his kid is on my team and so it was before the meet started and everything. We had some downtime and he's asking, mm -hmm. well, let me ask you a couple of nutrition questions. Like, okay, fine. Sure. <laughs> go ahead. And uh, he was like, okay, well, what about this? This is, I said, well, here's the, here's the issue is that, um, and he was talking about gluten being, he, he, he's figured out he's sensitive to gluten. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, okay, well, here's the issue is not that you can have gluten once a week or you can have like, you really can't have it at all. Right. Because of what it does. It, it causes your gut to be leaky. Yeah. And then, you know, and then it causes these other issues. Um, but with gluten or whether it's gluten or glyphosate or whatever, like it's been shown that some of those in some people can take up to 30 days to heal that one exposure. Yeah. And so when I, when people are telling me like, Oh, but I have my cheat meal once a week. I'm like, well, you're restarting your 30 days. Yep. Like, so, so it's true. not, you know, it's not like a, you know, you're just, you're going to look at inside the bandaid and see, Oh, it's healing. Well, okay. Let me put it back. But it's like, you're, it's like you open the bandaid and you go, Oh, now I just cut it completely open again. And I got to start from scratch. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. One of the so. things Gundry told me was that, uh, you, you brought up gluten. Um, gluten is actually, uh, a lectin yeah. and, um, that's like the big thing that he talks about is lectins. It's a type of protein that can be very damaging to our gut. And I, that was the news to me. And, and, kind of devastating because there's a lot of foods that I like <laughs> with gluten and I, I like beer and it's, it's just like, Oh yeah. man, I guess I probably shouldn't be having gluten anymore. So right. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, in terms of nutrition, you know, I just talked about how, uh, you know, there really is no like one specific diet for everybody, but right. I do believe there are some characteristics to every diet that's out there that mm -hmm. are kind of universal in terms of like right. good, good health. So what are some things that you would recommend that for just like the standard American diet that we need to be eliminating right. and more people need to be incorporating into their diet? Well, I, I'm a huge proponent of, uh, raw vegetables, raw fruits. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean myself, I'm vegan mm -hmm. and I have been for almost two years. Um, uh, I was vegetarian for about a year before that as I and part of the reason, just side note, part of the reason that I, I am is one, I believe it's the healthiest way for me. Mm -hmm. But when I started teaching nutrition and was seeing that some people need to be vegan right. for them, um, well, I'm a lead by example kind of guy. I've got to, I've got to see what it feels like first right. before I can then tell somebody this is the best for you or this is the side effects or what. Sure. So, sure. Um, but to get back to the original question, it, it's the, the raw vegetables and raw fruits. Um, mm. And when I say that, I mean, I'm okay with like, you know, steamed or, but it's when you get into like cooking them down into where you can't really tell that it, it was an onion to begin with, or it was a mm. green bean to begin with. Like, yep. That's where you get into the problem. Um, having a lot of those in your diet because the, the fiber content is what the microbiome needs. Mm. Um, and so they're going to feed off of that and they're, that's going to help your microbiome flourish and the good bacteria to flourish and to not have uh, things that are sort of from the, to move away from the sad diet mm. is to cut out those things that are uh, the processed foods. So the high sugar yep, and then um, in the stuff that's cooked in processed vegetable oils, mm. because the process to get to that vegetable oil um, 
it's like the the when somebody tells me, you know, like, oh, you you, you tell me I can't have cheese anymore. I'm like, well, cheese is a byproduct, so you're taking stuff that's left over. Yeah. From a from a you know from one process, and this is the waste. Right. And then you're going to use that, and and then people are ask you know other people ask about protein shakes. Mm-hmm. That's a big topic. Yep. And I say, okay, well, just protein shakes are great if you stay away from the ones with whey in them, unless your goal is to be super jacked up bodybuilder. Right. That's the way to get there. But otherwise, stay away from the ones with whey in them because whey yep. is then a byproduct of the cheese process. Right. So now you're a waste times two, <laughs> you know, and it's like, is that really what you want right. in your body? You yep, know? exactly. So, no, it's, it's really interesting. I, I would say for the most part, hopefully people realize now that we need more vegetables in our diet. Yep. Um, it's, I don't know if I want to call it common knowledge, but it is something that we all kind of know now, like you need more vegetables, Right. but it's fascinating how many people don't actually do it you know they don't actually yeah. incorporate veggies into their into their diet you know it's one thing to look for far into nutrition and you know eliminate gluten or eliminate lectins or right. uh you know if you if you uh, have too much sugar like make sure you're not you know consuming as much sugar as you have been you know there's some specific things that you can pinpoint right. to to remove or to improve um but let's just start with veggies. Like, let's just right. start there. And unfortunately, many people, they know that they should be doing it and they just don't take action on that. So hopefully people well, listening to this can encourage And it's making that. sure that you're not like, when I say, vet, you know, raw fruits and vegetables, it's not like, okay, well, well, I like oranges, so I'll just eat oranges all day long. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, it's, it, that's better than eating, you know, fried chicken all day long. But exactly. like, it's, it's the mixing it up of, uh, of the veggies. And so you want to be at a point where throughout the week you're getting 30 to 40 different vegetables and fruits, different mm. plant based. Yep. Um, and that can be beans too. Like mm-hmm. when I'm looking at it that wide of a, um, but you want 30 to 40 different, different colors, different textures. Um, interesting. Is that because, because they just have different nutrients? Each one has different types of nutrients that we need. What's the, what's the reasoning behind a variety of, of fruits and veggies? It's, it is it, part of it's the nutrients. Um, and part of it is that with everybody's microbiome being different, mm-hmm. like if, if, and, and this can be even a couple, because obviously you're coming from different genetic backgrounds. Right. Um, so whereas like, my microbiome may flourish on broccoli, kale, mm. apples. My wife's may flourish on cauliflower, oranges. Like, mm. yep. you know, we could flourish on two different things. And so sure. if, if you're getting a variety, for one, and you may not need to stay on that variety forever, right. that, that big of a variety. But to start out for sure, because you'll notice your body works better mm. on certain foods. Yep. And that sort of, that's where you can fine tune and say, okay, now yes. I'm starting to see. So if I, I can, I can narrow it down to these, maybe 15 that I got to mm. make, I got to make sure I get these 15 in every week. Yes. So. Yeah. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about experimenting to see what works best for your body and right. how, how you feel after eating certain foods. And I'm a big fan of having kind of like a food journal or log of just mm-hmm. jotting down like, okay, this is what I ate. And the, the hour or two directly after that meal, this is how I felt, you know, I either felt really good, full of energy, felt clean or, or the opposite. So I think that's important as well. Yeah. Well, and even tracking it to like two, three days. Yeah. Especially, especially if you're coming off a completely normal American diet Yep. and you're just deciding, okay, I'm going to start doing this. Yeah. Um, Cause those side effects can last two, three days of you actually feeling it. Not to mention how long it lasts inter- internally, but yep, you know, yep. and that's one of the things that that a lot of people that are on the sad diet right now, they they don't know what good feels like and bad feels like in their body. Mm-hmm. Like they've lost that ability to to see that, uh, except for those high spikes of dopamine when they have a sugar treat, you know, right? Um, but they don't have that ability anymore, and it, and it's not it's not a bad thing. It's it's not saying that they're bad people or anything. It's just that their body's lost that connection. 
yep. to be able to tell them three days later, I feel horrible because I ate this mm. three days ago. Sure. You know, whereas interesting. somebody like me that's been super clean for so long now, if I eat something like I'll know if I, if I go out to eat somewhere and I order something, but it gets cross contaminated or for whatever reason, something gets mixed in and like, I'll know pretty quickly. Oh yeah. It was, it, and I won't even know, like it, it was that meal. I can tell you it was that bite of food. Interesting. It did it. Wow. So, That's yeah. crazy how much our bodies and our minds respond to certain types of foods. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a buddy that is into nutrition and eats very clean and he hasn't had like any kind of fast food and, probably five years or, or longer. Yeah. And he was telling me how like a lot of people ask, like, don't you just miss having a slice of pizza or a Big Mac <laughs> from McDonald's? And he was like, no, I really don't. Like I, I've now in a rhythm and mm-hmm. a lifestyle where like, this is what my body wants and craves. And if I have anything else, like it just doesn't even taste good. So I always find yeah. that interesting. Well, and it's, and, and that's, what's, what's really funny is that I'll go to the groceries. I do most of the shopping for our family, just from our, lifestyle standpoint and how it yep. works. And so I'll go in and I'm like, Oh my gosh, they have pomegranates now, you know? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the crazy guy in the fruit section going, oh, right. This is in season. Yay. You know, like, yep. Yep. So, it's funny. Yeah. That's good. Uh, cool. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the fitness side of things and what you're involved yeah. in. Um, you know, you got your degree in physiology and you you ran track and field at, at Texas A&M. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's kind of talk a little bit more about uh, the work you're doing right now with fitness. I also understand uh, you're doing some work right now with, you know, you're still an athlete, right? You're still yeah. running track. And so why don't you tell us a little bit more about, about that? Uh, I think I read somewhere that you are top 80. Uh, tell me out here. What was it? The yeah. top 80 in your, in your age group or? Yeah, in my age group um, in 2019. Uh, I was 80th in the world in the indoor 3000 meters. Um, that's incredible. So it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, that's fun. You know, that's, that's the fun piece for me, um, of life in, uh, it's something that obviously I, I grew up running, um, and in sports, I took a break from it, got married, kids, the whole, you know, lifestyle, everything. Yep. And you know, when you get to be 40, you start thinking about different things. You're like, Oh, I wonder if I could still do this. I wonder if sure. this could. And I didn't realize that there was a, a whole master's circuit. So they consider over 40 masters. Okay. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's, let's start, let's start being competitive again. And locally I was winning races against all age groups. Wow. So I was like, you know what, let's, let's just see what happens. And, and, uh, so that's, that's been a lot of fun to, to continue that. Um, and, and it, it feeds into the fitness side of the business. Yep. Um, and so I, I, I train people both virtually, uh, and in person. Okay. Um, a lot of the, the kids that I, or I say kids, a lot of the people I train in person are kids, they're high school kids, uh-huh. um, that are aspiring athletes. And so I just try and add in whether it's, strength and conditioning or the expertise in mm. track and field. Um, I work with kids in all sports, but, uh, you know, it's, I have had, I had one kid that, uh, was six, four played basketball. When he came to me, he couldn't dunk. Hmm. And I was like, you're six, four, you should be able to, and he <laughs> yeah. was just this lanky kid. And, wow. um, and nobody had ever taught him how to jump properly. Right. And so taught him how to do that. And he, his parents, messaged me after his first game after working with me and they were like his entire game is above the rim now so Mm. um very cool yeah so it's you know it it, but it's just teaching kids a little bit more about like what's possible when you can reach through that pain point that pain threshold right um and push through a little bit more yeah um and and getting your body physically ready not just I think a lot of coaches and I've talked to a lot of coaches. So I, I, I say this, not trying to be detriment, you know, not trying to tear them down or right. say they're ba- doing a bad job because they're doing everything they can in the time frame that they have to do it. Sure. But a lot of times they just don't have the time to work on the basic physical fitness uh, conditioning side of it. Sure. So I work with kids trying to teach them that like, if you're, if your sport is, you know, four quarters or if you're running a f- cross country race, 
my goal is to get you to the point where you're, you feel physically the same way at the end of the game as you did at the beginning. Mm, very cool. So you were a college athlete. This was in the nineties, right? You were in, yep. uh, so do you think in terms of just the idea of like the, the fitness side of your coaching and just physiology as a whole, you know, obviously I'm, I'm sure there are th- some things that have changed over the last few decades, a lot of things oh, yeah. that you've learned. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you think the fact that you're still an active athlete, you're better able to serve your, your clients on that fitness side? I think so. Um, I think it, it helps because it's like I said, with the experimenting on myself and, yeah. and with the team, it, you know, those new things that are out, I can experiment and go, okay, well, this is how we did it 25 years ago. Right. And this is what they're saying to do it now. And this, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, yeah, this is better. The new stuff is, you know, beating the tried and true. Mm. But other times it's like, you know what, that tried and true just still, it's, it's been done for decades for a reason that right. way. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of things that are fundamentals that, that, uh, like you said, are tried and true and they, they, they're kind of timeless in a way. Like there's certain right. things that we know work and, and mm-hmm. you might as well stick to it. But then right. there's also a lot of things that we are discovering over the last several years. And what's pretty cool, I think, and I'm sure something you're excited about is that it's, it's a field that like we, we've been talking about, you have your fundamentals that will always be there, but there's always going to be new things that we will be discovering right. in the years to come. Yep. So that's, that's pretty exciting for, for you yeah. and for your business as well. Yeah. And I can tell one of the things, just for an example standpoint, one of the things that um, in the, it, back in the day when you ran a race, the idea was you, you, you know, obviously you gave it your all, you ran hard, you did. Yep. Well, you take the next day off yeah. or you just go for easy. Like you don't, you're not pushing yourself. You just sort of shaking your legs out. You just, it's just yep. an easy run. You're not going, well now in the last, in the last, really in the last year, research has started coming out that, you know, if it, unless it's of course your peak race, mm-hmm. if it's your peak race, that's the end of the season, different story. But if it's in the middle of the season, you run a race, there's research showing the next day you run a hard workout, like a really hard workout. And it, the, it, the benefits to your body and your system in a recovery standpoint outweigh the old tried and true Interesting. Easy, easy run. So Wow. So you're saying the day after a race, it's better to kind of keep at it and, and have another like tough workout. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Cause like you said, I remember, so I, I ran track and field in high school all four years. I was never fast enough to go to Texas, <laughs> Texas A&M, but, right. um, you know, even, and I, I played football and that was kind of like the thing is anytime you had a game, football game or a big, big, uh, meet, you know, ran, ran uh, a sprint at your track meet, yep. uh, you would always want to kind of take that next day, either take it off and rest or just like minimal workout, like stretching. Right. Yep. So, so what is it? Like, what's the science behind that in terms of that very next day? You know, why did we think before that it was good to have rest immediately and what changed to, to now it's better to have a little bit more of a rigorous training right afterwards? Well, I think the, the old schools, I mean, it, it sort of makes sense, logical sense of, you know, you, you, you just gave everything you've got, you've yep. got to, you've got to take time to recover. Like mm-hmm. time is the, is the benefit there okay. above anything else. I think is the, the old school thinking, but now it's part of it is just getting muscle firing, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and getting your body because if you're, if you're pushing your body to the limit, you're building up lactic acid, you're building up all the, you know, toxins in your body, you're tearing down mm-hmm. your muscles, you're doing different things. Um, but coming back that next day and doing a tough workout, obviously not, you're not trying to go all out race pace right. again, and a, but to do an, a tough workout the next day, um, it helps your body recover and your muscles recover. But it also, it, it also does something psychological, mm-hmm. I think, because um, I've done this a couple of times in you know, myself, but I, I've done it with my team. And it's like, there's a psychological barrier of, I just ran as hard as I could, you know, 
whether you ran your fastest race or not, I just ran as hard as I could. There's no way I could do anything else. And then mm. 12 hours later, 24 hours later, you come out and you do a hard workout. Psychologically, you go, you know, the next race I could probably give more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, that's cool. So do you think the same applies for long distance, like marathons? I've, I've run two marathons now and I don't know if I could do any kind of exercise right. the next day. Um, but maybe I could, yeah. maybe it would be a good thing to go out for like a three mile run or t- you know five mile run. What do you think on, on that? I think, I think, and I've, I've seen people, I haven't actually run a marathon myself. I was, I was actually starting on that path when I realized I still had some speed. And so I yeah. came back down to the lower level uh, for a little while. But I think there's, I've seen, cause I've seen people that have, that have run a marathon and then tried to go out and run, you know, a, a good distance the next day, mm-hmm. eight, 10 miles. Yeah. Um, and that's tough. Yeah. It's really tough because and I think the marathon is, is at that point where I think if you're, if you're competing at something that's over, uh, you know, over 10 miles, over 13 miles, where you're, you're sort of like a, you know, a football game, you're not on the field every play running all out every play. Mm-hmm. Like you've got some downtime in there. Even if yeah. you're playing both sides of the ball, right? you've got a little downtime in there. Yep. When you're running a half marathon, you're running a marathon, you don't. Like you're – It's nonstop. Unless you stop and walk, you're – going the whole way yep. and you're still moving when you're walking. Yep. So I think there's a point in there from a time standpoint where yeah. you're going to hit that diminishing returns. Sure. Um, when you try and do that, that right. hard workout again. So, um, so I think if you're, if you're competing at that hour and a half to two hour break, yep. And that's how long then, then I think you, you need to forgive the, the idea of doing a hard workout the next day and just sure. I still think I still think doing some exercise is good. I agree with that. Yeah. Keeping I, your body limber, whether it's just stretching or just Yep. Just laying in bed all day long is not the best idea. I agree with that. So I ran just to give our listeners here some context. I did the Chicago Marathon uh in two thousand seventeen. That was my first one. And the next day just laid around all day and yeah. just thought to myself, I'm going to, I ran a marathon. I'm going to rest. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to sit on the couch all day long. I deserve this. And I remember that like the rest of the week was tough. Like it was yeah. a noticeable, um, challenge for me just with my, my, my muscles. Yep. And then the, the following year I ran the Berlin marathon in Germany oh, cool. and really cool marathon. And, uh, the next day I was with a group of friends and since we were in a, foreign city, you know, in a different continent and you know, mm-hmm. we wanted to explore. I walked a ton that next day all over mm-hmm. Berlin and, and even the days following. And I just noticed such a difference in my recovery time yeah. between the two marathons was just, like you said, it doesn't have to be, um, really rigorous training after, after a marathon, it probably shouldn't be, but at least right. do something. And I, I noticed a big difference there. So, yeah, very cool. Um, I'm kind of going back a little bit here on, in terms of we, we started out with the nutrition piece and then yeah. went over to fitness. Um, but I understand, you know, your, your big mission and your big goal is to help people function better from mm-hmm. the cell level. So right. what else is there that maybe we haven't covered in, in that topic? Well, I think understanding that, that when you, when somebody tells you that, um, you know, this doesn't work for them because they're their genes, Mm-hmm. Um, that everybody has, you know, obviously our DNAs are different. Otherwise we'd all look exactly the same and act exactly the same and all that. Yeah. But your, your predisposition on your gene side of things for certain things to happen to you, that doesn't mean that is guaranteed to happen. Yeah. You can, you can by what you eat, by what you feed yourselves and not just like it, when I say what you eat, it, trying to break it down from the macro level. I think too many people get caught in the macro level, yep. but going down to the micronutrients is what your cells need. And it's understanding that if I eat this, this, and this, I could turn these genes off mm. that are going to be causing me to be predisposed to cancer or, you know, whatever, or even good things. Like if I eat this, this, and this, I'm going to turn the good genes off and then my longevity is going to go away or yep um and so and, and that that can be different for each person sure and that's that's where you've got to you know get into some fine-tuning 
there's obviously there's there's functional medicine doctors out there that can do different tests that can really narrow down that for you mm-hmm. if that's a if that if that's something that's a major concern but i think that for most people uh, and i i'd say somewhere between 90 to 95 percent of people just experimentation with diet yep will get you where you want to be yep um exactly you just got to stick to it right and understand that these changes are not going to be overnight Mm. um you know remembering that the healthy way to lose weight is one to two pounds a week Mm. it's not this you know 30 or 40 pounds in four weeks and right you know not typical results on the screen you know i mean that's it's one to two pounds a week which means there's gonna be weeks you can have nothing Mm. There's going to be weeks where you gain weight, yep. Um, but tracking that on a long trajectory, but also understanding that it's just because you're thin or you reach that goal weight doesn't necessarily mean you are healthy internally. Mm. You could still have things going on. Yeah, that's um, so, so true. Yeah. I would actually say uh, I'm probably one of those people that you know I've always been thin. Yeah. I've always lived a pretty active lifestyle. I've played all kinds of sports growing up. I ran track, played football, and I'm still active. I, I still like to run. I like to mm-hmm. walk every day. So I live an active lifestyle. But um, I will say, admittedly so, my my nutrition and my diet is probably not as good as it can be. You know, right. I, I do I do like to, you know, enjoy pizza every once in a while. And uh, occasionally, I, I shouldn't admit this, but I, I got to be honest with everybody. I, I do like McDonald's every once in a right. while. Um, I know I shouldn't be doing those things, but um, oftentimes my excuse is like, "Oh, well, I'm thin. I have good genes. Mm-hmm. You know, my my meta- metabolism is slow." And you know, come up with all the excuses in, in the book. Right. But uh, right. I think that's a big takeaway: is even though you're thin or naturally thin, that doesn't just mean you can eat whatever you want. And I'm sure you probably see right. that in a lot with your clients and athletes you work with. Yeah, um, especially and, young people. You know, and, I'm sure yeah. all kinds of teenagers are like, oh, "I'll eat whatever." Yeah, I mean, I've got because I've got kids that'll show up and they're like, "Oh, I just had this, this, and this," and I'm like, "Really? Did you really?" <laughs> just like, um, but then I've got other other kids that I've I've worked with for years, and you know, I mean, one of my one of my go tos, um, which is is it's great for athletes, but it's also great for for anybody because of what it does internally for for uh, your cells and for your body for microbiome is uh, beet juice. Mm. and it it's better than from a recovery standpoint it's better than anything else on the market that i've found um gatorade any of those other things um because it's the natural properties that it has and what it does in at your cellular level to alkaline your body so raises your ph which brings it it forces all the toxins out basically um and so I've got a, I mean, I've got a high school cross country team of boys that drink beet juice every day. Wow. Like that's how, like it, it's crazy. But, you know, I, I look at it and, and we had a, a cross country meet Saturday and I was standing around talking to the parents as they were cooling down and they were talking about how they can't find beet juice at the store because each of them was buying out the supply. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm good. like, I, I like step back going, this is a conversation of, 15 to 17 year old boys parents right. <laughs> talking about beet juice. I was like, this is a little crazy. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. But, uh, <laughs> but it's great for the everybody because of what it does from the pH level in the body. Yep. Um, and so if it's doing that for athletes at a recovery standpoint, it's going to do that for anybody at any point. It's going right. to pull all the toxins out of your body and help you stabilize um, mm-hmm. stabilize your microbiome, stabilize your pH. And so that's one of the things that if you've, if you struggle with like your upset stomachs and yeah. things like that, um, experiment with beet juice okay. once, a, once a day, just get in a, a you know, uh, and it, if you don't like the taste of it, I totally get that. It's like, it can taste a little earthy and a little, sure. um, I know people that just do it in a shot. And so they'll just do a, you know, real concentrated shot of it. And then follow it up with something else so they can get taste buds tasting normal again. Yeah. That's really cool. It's so funny. You just brought up uh, that topic and pH levels. I was just, I can't remember if it was a podcast or it was an audio book, but just yesterday I was listening to something and they were talking about uh, alkaline and Mm -hmm. how it can stabilize pH levels. And uh, what, for people that are listening that 
don't understand. I mean, I'm sure they've heard the term pH levels, hopefully, but yeah. uh, maybe they don't understand like why that's important. Like, what? I guess kind of just give us a basic framework of like what that is and and why that's important. Well, I think uh, the easiest way to do that is everybody's seen a swimming pool, um, and if you've ever had a swimming pool, you know that you've got this little test kit and you've mm-hmm. got to get the pH level at the right level yep. so that it's safe for everybody to go in. Um, well, when you have a high pH in the pool, there's, it's, it's blue, it's clear, mm. um, you know, it's, you can swim in it. Yep. It may smell like chlorine, but, you know, basically it's, it's safe. Mm-hmm. When the pH level goes down, then you've got, you know, algae growing, you've got little bugs that can start growing in it, depending on how long you let the pH sit. Okay. You know, it's going to turn green. All the stuff you don't want to see right. in a pool. Um, now, granted, I I understand that's that's life growing, and so you might think, well, that's life growing. So wouldn't you want a low pH because life's growing? <laughs> well, but those are the bad things growing. Uh, you know, that's the the algae you don't want. That's those bugs you don't want. Um, interesting. And so if you think about that, like that's what you're doing in your body and your microbiome. Mm. If you raise the pH, it's nice and clean in there. The good things are going to work. Hmm. Um, and if you have a low pH, which what causes a low pH sugar, processed oils, like all those things. So it's when you have a low pH, um, you know, it's, you're going to feed those bad bacteria, uh, which are not going to allow your body to to operate properly. Interesting. Wow. Okay. That's, that's cool. That's, that helps a lot. I mean, visually that, is a good analogy of the of swimming pool and mm-hmm. basically all those same things are happening inside our body. So that's right. definitely something you want to be paying attention to. Yeah. Very cool. Um, you mentioned a little bit there with, with sugar. So you have your new book coming out. I think it's available in January. Uh, yep. No more sugar coating. Yep. What would you like us to know about that? What are some basic things some some big ideas that you're really excited about with the new book? Well, I, I'm really excited about the fact that it's a little bit, it's still uh, basically got its, its bones in health and nutrition, mm-hmm. um, but it, it spreads a little bit more into if you take care of your health and nutrition, this is what you can achieve with the rest of your life. Um, and so, you know, it, the, my first book was basically like, here's what you've got to do. Here's mm-hmm. the reason why. But this is more of the like, what's the potential of living your life with, without sugarcoating? Yep. Um, what's the potential of, and, and breaking it down to, so the, the basic analogy is if you, you know, if you eat, you know, candy pecans or candy apples or what, okay, well you're eating it that because it's got the sugar coating and it tastes great and it's mm. going to give you a little bit of a sugar high. Yep. But what happens if you just eat the pecans or you just eat the apples or you just eat the f- food without the sugar coating, mm. you, you may not get that immediate high but you're going to get a lifelong high yeah. of having a healthy body and what can you accomplish? Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's sort of the premise. And then what can you accomplish if, if you take the sugar coating off of your life and let people see your passion and what you really want to achieve mm. and bring the people around you that can help you achieve that? What yeah. could your life be like? What could other people's lives be like if we all did that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the basic premise of of nutrition and eating cleaner is that you know if you do these things you eat the certain way you do eat healthier you eat cleaner what can that do for your life you know how much more energy will you have how much is that going to improve your activity your endurance your performance your relationships your lifestyle your longevity i mean it's just it's fascinating to think how a simple thing, and it's it's complex when you kind of get into it on a deeper level in terms of nutrition sure. and diet. But uh, if you take a step back and look at it, it's it's pretty simple. It's like eat right. these foods and don't eat these foods. Eliminate, in your case with this book, eliminate sugar, right. and and then see all of the benefits that you're going to have from it in your life, which is really cool. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Uh, just on that note, what are your thoughts and maybe you have some more information on like we've talked about the standard american diet 
how much sugar is in our standard American diet that maybe oh we're gosh. not even aware of? <laughs> <laughs> is it a lot? I'm assuming it's a lot. <laughs> yes, it's a lot. Um, uh, oh my gosh, and I'm, I'm missing on the exact, but I want to say, because uh, I, I have a presentation where I present this point, the average American kid, you know, uh, 10 years old, mm-hmm. you know, 8 to 12 years old, 10 years old, yep. the average American kid gets, uh, I believe it's 34 tablespoons of sugar a day. Oh, my God. That's I mean, scary. That's, and, I shouldn't be laughing. That's not even but funny. That's, that's, it, yeah. I mean, it, it's not. You know, it's not. And it's, it's, it's scary for our school system yeah. because of what that causes. Um, it's scary for what generationally is going to happen in a few yep. years. Yep. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's really, it's way too much. Um, yeah. you know, and, and we shouldn't be, me- we really shouldn't be measuring sugar in tablespoons. We should be measuring it in grams mm. like, you know, but, but we have to measure it in tablespoons because it's just, nobody understands if it was, you know, 3,000 grams. Uh, right. Is that, is that, well, you the know, tablespoons provides the tablespoons it. Provides it. Yeah. And you can actually see what a tablespoon looks like in 34 right. of those is a lot for, especially kid that is yeah. a smaller body than you and I. Yep. Wow. That's, that's very scary. Um, you know, I, I admitted to enjoying some pizza every once in a while and some fast food here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I, the reason why I like to talk about that publicly is that I am hoping that audience can hear that and say, okay, this is a guy that is not trying to be, you know, an expert and I'm, I'm not trying to like shame people for eating right. certain ways. Right. I want them to like listen to this and say, okay, this is somebody that had a really awful diet not too long ago, a couple of years ago and is making baby steps. It's, it, it's exactly what yeah. you said earlier, you know, take small steps and yeah. you don't have to fix it all overnight. You can do these things one step at a time, one day at a time. Yep. You know, it's like the old saying, your your days lead to weeks, weeks lead to months, yep. your months lead to the years, and your years make up your life. So yep. I'm hoping people can hear this and say, all right, I, I need to make some changes. It's not going to happen all overnight. Uh, right. If I can just start making, you know, better improvements here this week and then maybe remove a little bit of sugar this week and, and then just see that snowball effect. Right. Well, and that's it's funny. One of the things I have a, uh, I have a 90-day – transformation nutrition plan yep. um, that I have available on my website. And in the, f- it's either in the first week or second week in very bold letters, um, you know, big, so everybody, could, when you're reading through it, you go, okay, I get it. It's if you mess up, it's okay. Like, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's when it comes to nutrition, depending on where you start, mm-hmm. the earlier you start. Yeah. The earlier you start with it, probably the easier it's going to be. Right. But everybody has a history they have to break from right. uh, with habits and you're going to mess up and you know, whether it's an intentional or unintentional, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it takes a long time to get to the point uh, to where, cause I'm, I'm uber disciplined with it. And like you said, I don't shame anybody else that, you know, yep. and, and I've been in networking events where I've had people come up, go, Ooh, don't look at what I'm eating. I'm like, I don't care what you're eating. Right. It's fine. Doesn't bother <laughs> right. me. Right. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm now at the point where if I go to a family dinner, uh, you know, where we'll go out to a restaurant or something and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'll just have water, yep. you know? And, and they're like, don't you want, no, I'm fine. Well, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. You feel bad. I, I don't feel bad. Right. Like, <laughs> it, it's my choice. Exactly. You know, I, so that's what I, that's just what I'm going to choose. It's okay. We're all going to have fun. We're going to have a good conversation. I, right. I don't have to eat to have a good conversation. Yep. Um, but I know not everybody's going to be at that point, especially starting out. So you're going to mm-hmm. go to dinner somewhere. You're going to go hang out with friends and you're going to wait, you know, 30 minutes later, you're going to go, Oh, I didn't realize I just ate that. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Yep. It's okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think that's a big takeaway is to not, not beat yourself up. Yep. And you can always, you can always start making changes. It's never too late to make those changes. Yep. I think it's being aware. Yes. Yeah. Awareness is a big thing too. Yeah. Being aware of of where you're at and where you're at in your journey and and what kind of changes you do need to make is really important. Yeah. Cool. 
Awesome. So J- Jerry, before I get to my last question here, um, where can people learn more about your work? I know we've talked about your, your books and your podcast. Yep. Where would you like to, to send people to learn more? Uh, so confidence through um, just for an easy, simple one. Um, they can get there and they can connect to everything else. The podcast and, uh, current book is on there. Um, and then, uh, if they want to follow me, um, I'm all in health and wellness on Instagram. Cool. So love that. And I'll be sure to link all of that up in uh, the description and show notes for people to cool. access that. Awesome. awesome. So my last question I have for you is who do you want to impact the most with your work? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, and, and I'll tell you one of the things that about, I guess, God, it's going on two years ago now. Um, when I was sitting there thinking, you know, like, okay, what, what's the purpose of this? What's, mm-hmm. you know, what's the bigger idea around everything? And what came to me was, uh, initially was, you know, reach 10,000 people. Mm. And I mean, it was maybe 10 or 15 minutes later that it was like, no, 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 that's, that's too small. It needs to be a million. And I was like, Whoa, <laughs> that's, that's huge. Um, but I think that, that really it's, I mean, that's a big number and, and, and I, I'm getting there step by step. Sure. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, is I want people to understand that it's all just one basic vision after another, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's not this huge, you don't have to put this huge pressure on yourself of where I want to be 20 years from now. Yep. It's just make a small decision now and they'll compound to as long as they're, whether they're good or bad decisions, they're going to compound the, way, yep. you know, so no, that's make so the good cool. decisions and just let them compound. I think that's exactly right. It's exactly what we were talking about with making those small changes mm-hmm. and don't beat yourself up if you, yep. you know, make a mistake here or there, but just know that every single day it's that small effort that will compound into the weeks and, and months yep. and years. So yep. very cool. I love that message. So. Cool. Awesome. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for your time and sharing, yeah. sharing your mission to my audience. And uh, I really, really appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you. You have a great day. You too.